Once again, welcome to my talk, and it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce all those image processing features that we have that are applicable to microscopy. Uh, well, maybe I should say up front, microscopy is a vast area, and we're just covering very tiny bit currently, uh, mostly what uh, is concerned with uh, light microscopy, and I'm not talking about uh, all the other ways you can uh, obtain images from uh, micro or nanoscale. So well, the abstract, you should have read, I guess, but uh, here's the outline of today's talk. Um, I'll try to bring it up in two, uh, well, two parts. Part number one, for those who are not into microscopy, I'll explain a little bit what the typical workflow would be if you do uh, obtain microscopic images and uh, like to process them in the Mathematica. And then in the second part of today's talk, I'll talk about some applications. Uh, well, most applications are that you measure features in an image in microscopy or that you do counting, cell counting, stuff like that. But I also will do some things that you probably can't do in any other software than Mathematica. So uh, the first part is like catching up what others already have. And the second part is to show that you can do things that others can't do in Mathematica. All right. So um, typical microscopy workplace nowadays looks somewhat like this. You don't sit over your microscope and look through an ocular anymore. You have a, a CCD camera or a CCD sensor mounted on the ocular, and uh, all the images that are obtained in the microscope are directly fed into a computer system in form of uh, all kinds of file formats out there. Then um, I'd like to point out that uh, usually uh, a microscope nowadays comes uh, with a movable a stage. So the stage where the uh, specimen is mounted on. Because the problem in microscopy is that your field of vision is rather small. Because you enlarge so much, you just see a very tiny portion of your specimen. And in order to get a bigger picture, you just have to move the specimen around. So you don't take just one picture usually, but you take an, whole, uh, an entire array of pictures. Um, then uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to obtain images in Mathematica, how to import them, and more importantly, how to get the meta information. And then I'll talk about what you usually do when you obtain images. Uh, so you have to do some pre-processing step. You have to correct for all the uh, shortcomings of the microscope, like uh, CCD misalignment, uh, correct faulty pixels in the CCD, or correct for uneven illumination. I, due to time reasons, I just focus on the latter one. Uh, the other ones, I think, are straight, uh, straightforward somewhat. And then, as I mentioned, uh, you have to assemble images because you don't just take one image, but a whole uh, array of images. Uh, then I have uh, one point here which I probably can skip because uh, Julio was so kind and already talked, took all my slides even, <laughs> and talked about it. Uh, and um, then I just uh, talk about here quickly how to combine 2D images in 3D volumes. And then comes the interesting part for those who do know Mathematica and want to go beyond what can be done so far. I will show how to present large images in Mathematica with dynamic image, which is a new object. Uh, I will show how you can write your, with dynamic interf the dynamic interface, dynamic uh, measurement um, front ends in Mathematica, show you how to do, do obje object segmentation, and then uh, uh, some automatic measurements and quantification programs. All right. Um, first up, there's a huge or vast array of file formats just for microscopy. And uh, we haven't come around to implement all those yet. And uh, the best way to cope with this uh, shortcoming in Mathematica is to utilize what's called bioformats. Sorry, that should be an S there. It's a, um, um, a software po project um, that is out there that you can download. It's for free. It's just that uh, if you want to use it commercially, it's not for free, so we can't just incorporate that in Mathematica. But you can easily attach it to Mathematica, and basically, once you download my talk, you have already everything installed. You can just run the following step using a Java link, uh, sorry, J-Link, and uh, that will help you to hook up to that particular um, package. So first, what you would have to do is um, you would have to load J-Link then uh, reinstall your Java implementation and assign more memory to it. Then uh, establish a place where you want to put the whole package. And then unless you already have the package or have that uh, folder that you just established, uh, you have to create it. And then, well, I won't do that because it will cost time, and I already did that before. You would just have to uh, execute this command, and this will automatically load 
uh, the jar, the Java jar, from the internet into your system at the right location. And then all that needs to be done is to hook up to it and some utility classes, and that's it. That's the whole installation of this bioformat object, so it can easily be done in Mathematica. And then you can build with Java link, or JLink, sorry, some functions on it, like an import of bioformat or an import of uh, bioformat metadata. And then we can see if this works. So uh, let me try. I define here, in relation to my notebook, uh, the path to a, a, file, a file called embryo. This particular file is in, uh, written in OpenLab, uh, L-E-F-F, -F, so somewhat similar uh, as TIFF. And then I just uh, call up here uh, the command import bioformat image, and this will load the image, this uh, image format into Mathematica. And just to prove that I actually did obtain something, I'll just manipulate this here. And uh, it's not just a single image, but it's a whole stack of images. And uh, you can just zoom through it and visualize what you see in this particular image. And then uh, on top of it, uh, it's quite helpful uh, to load the metadata as well. But unfortunately, in this particular case, the pixel size is not in the metadata, I think. Uh, and uh, that's still something we try to work on to automatically deduce the typical pixel size that are in these images so that they can do measurements more uh, naturally. OK, um, so once we have the images, we can now start to uh, try to uh, put things together. And what I have here is, uh, so it just works a little faster, a whole list of uh, images of a DNA. Uh, actually, it's uh, um, an array of four times four images, each image just one megapixel large, and those I try to combine now. Well, we do have image align, and uh, so you can, could do that in principle yourself, but it's a lot of uh, wiggling and trying to get things straight. So with this talk comes a command that's called stitch image array. So it's a kind of a preliminary stitching command that you are welcome to use. And that will allow me to automatically align these, uh, uh, this array in a very robust manner. I just have to provide two variables. Uh, one is the amount of overlap that I have between every uh, uh, image. So in this case, it's 128 pixels. And then also the variance, uh, because the stage will never be completely exact. Uh, but you can at least get these from the microscope, these variables, these parameters. And then you automatically, and I just have pre-calculated that because it takes roughly 30 seconds, you can obtain an image like this. Now, if you look closely, you will see that you see a grid in this image. And that's uh, typically what happens because the illumination of uh, the specimen under a microscope is usually not even. Uh, so we have to actually go back now one step and correct for illumination uh, deficiencies of the microscope. And what you can do is take a blank image uh, so that you get an idea or get a whole sequences of blank images. So you get an idea what the illumination of this particular microscope looks like. And uh, uh, so if I have this one here, sorry, it's the wrong variable. The illumination has this unevenness, so it's really uh, not that... Uh, even as, uh, as one would assume or like to have it to be. So all I have to do then is just uh, uh, generate a kind of a correction mask by taking the reciproc of that particular case and uh, just add uh, machine epsilon to avoid a division by zero. And then I can multiply this correction term onto all these tiles that I had before. And then if I repeat the stitching, I get, uh, whoops, here we go, a perfect resulting image. Well, the image is actually much bigger. I just uh, downscaled it, so we have it here faster. OK, as I said, the uh, big edge, uh, the, sorry. Uh, I'll get there in a second. This I will skip. You saw that particular slide already before. It's about image stacking, because you not just take several images that are spatially separated, but you also take images that are uh, separated by the focal depth. And uh, in order to combine them, images uh, as, uh, well, I repeat it anyway, uh, as, um, Julia has shown you have well, one focal depth, another one, another one, and then you can combine with image focus, combine all these uh, to an entire image with a, a deeper um, focal length. All right, so once you have that, you end up usually with fairly big images. And uh, unfortunately, so far, when you have an image object in Mathematica, either you make it automatically smaller so it fits into your notebook, or um, 
well, it just doesn't fit and you have a hard time viewing it. And uh, because of that, we now have come up with a, a command that's called image, a dynamic image. And that allows you to do two things. First of all, it allows you to look at very large images without getting the entire image into memory. Because there are images out there uh, that are gigabytes uh, big, and then uh, you won't have the capability of actually having everything in your uh, RAM. So this is an out of core setup. Um, it's again the uh, DNA image, the stitched one that I have done before, so it's not really that big. And this dynamic image basically comes up with a viewing window, just like uh, uh, on Google Earth, for example, that you just see a, par a part of the image. And you have different ways now to zoom, pan, scroll uh, in this uh, viewing pan. First of all, you have these scroll bars, but they are not ordinary scroll bars. They have these handles on the uh, side, which allow you to stretch them or make them shorter. And doing so, you zoom in and out accordingly. So basically, then the zoom bar down here gives you an indication how large of a portion of the original image you're viewing currently. You can just put your mouse on it, move around. Well, should, you can use these buttons to zoom in and out. You can have a bigger viewing area and so forth. And all of this is fairly, still fairly responsive, even though all the data needs to be loaded into Mathematica as I go. And then, of course, I can do the same here uh, with images in memory. And uh, so it looks just, uh, look and feel is very much alike. You can move it around like this. And furthermore, you can, with these options, have access to uh, 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 these dynamic features of that image. For example, you can control, not just in this image itself, the scale or the position. You can also have here these controls outside and build your own uh, interface with all these uh, gimmicks that you can think of. So you can also, unfortunately, I don't have that prepared, have uh, two images side by side and just uh, uh, synchronously uh, zoom in, zoom out, pan around, and compare. All right. Um, and then at the end of the day, uh, the big objective in uh, microscopy is to actually measure things. And here, Mathematica gives you the total freedom to construct any kind of measuring device on your image as you like, because you can just, with epilogue, basically construct any kind of graphics object on that image in, a, in the image coordinate system. And uh, you can still zoom in and out, pan around. So uh, this is, again, an image of the embryo. Just one slice. I can zoom in. I can zoom out. I can move around here the position of the circle. And I can change the radius of the circle and thereby, in a way, measuring, for example, here the, the size of the cell down here. Just by looking now at the size, I can read off the radius and do similar uh, measurements like distance measurements, contour uh, length, and so forth. OK, so all these uh, necess necessities in microscopy are built in. And the last one, because it gets much more popular nowadays, you can take, uh, you can basically generate volumes with microscopic data. Either you just uh, constantly slice off a specimen and just take uh, one image at a time, so you get a whole stack. Or you have other means um, to obtain different layers of information. And uh, in Mathematica, all you have to do is take the stack of images, place it in image 3D. In this case, I resize it because the Y direction was a little bit, uh, had a different resampling uh, than the uh, X and Y direction. And then uh, by just thresholding a little bit the grayscale values around it, I can have a fairly good impression what the 3D distribution of that particular cell looks like. I can turn it. I can do measurements in it. Whatever I can do in, on volumes, I can now also do on these volumes from microscopy. All right, so this is a little bit like the typical workflow uh, you would have in a software that uh, in most cases nowadays comes with a microscope, uh, except that you now can also do that in Mathematica. And now I will show you a few steps of what you can do uh, uh, of what's possible in Mathematica to construct your own uh, programs to work on microscopic data. So typical scenario, you have uh, a pathology, uh, an image of a, a, a set of samples or, or cells, and you have to count the cells, and you possibly also have to classify the cells. So the first um, task at hand here is to actually segment the cells to see where's the cell, where's the background, background 
And for that purpose, uh, I do a trick in image processing. I first look at that image at this typical scale of a cell. So it's just like uh, squinting a little bit with your eyes and just seeing a bit more diffuse, and you just don't see the details of the cell, but you see where cells are. And this is what I basically have obtained here with a Laplacian Gaussian filter. It gives me a certain scale, the typical scale of a cell, and then I can just count or see where there are maxima. And these maxima are typically now the positions of each cell. So I just already got very quickly and very easily the, uh, these cell seeds. Uh, and um, these center points of these cells are now used as seeds in a region growing uh, uh, algorithm. Here in region binarized, it basically grows from that seed and tries to fill the entire cell. And that's what I get. Unfortunately, I do have here a few holes uh, in the cell, so I use a filling transform, which basically now gives me a fairly robust uh, segmentation of all these cells. And uh, just by doing a little bit of post-processing, taking away a pixel on the boundary so I don't have too many, uh, I don't extend into the background, which uh, can happen with region binarize, I now have a segmentation and I can see if that segmentation makes sense. And as you can see, all the orange parts are the cells that have been recognized. And except for those well not clearly defined cells down here, it has done a fairly good job. And then the second step usually is to really do scrutinize, scrutinize and uh, to select certain cell types. And for that purpose, in Mathematica, we have select components. So you have here components uh, due to the segmentation. And then every uh, component can be selected with this command by providing any kind of criteria for any kind of property that uh, we provide here, like area, circularity, elongation, and so forth. And in this case, I get away with just measuring uh, cells, uh, the cell area and the uh, circularity of a cell. So the round cells are typically more circular than the star-like uh, cells. So by just selecting cells of a certain size and uh, where the circularity is not too high, I get all the sickle cells, uh, the star-like, uh, sorry, the star-like cells in this case, uh, and then I can do a count and do measurements on that. So this would be a very typical uh, application. Another typical application is like in fluoroscopy, uh, in fluorescence microscopy is to see how much fluorescence is taken up by uh, certain types of cells uh, to do these kind of measurements. And this is a data set we obtained from Professor Roy here at UIUC next door. Uh, and what this is, is basically a set of cells, brain cells, I think from a rat if I'm not mistaken. And the blue channel here just shows the cells as they are. And then uh, a different image has been registered and put on top of this that uh, shows the fluorescent dye um, as it was taken up by these cells. And the question now is what cells or how many cells actually did take up the dye because those cells have certain properties in contrast to others. And this is a bit mis misleading because if you look at this here, uh, even if you have uh, in certain areas a lot of uh, fluorescence, the, that fluorescence doesn't have to be in a cell. And still, I don't know how many cells are taken and how many of the cells actually are covered by fluorescence and so forth. So this is a non-trivial um, task to do. And the first thing we have to do is basically, again, do a segmentation of the, uh, the cells. I do now a different approach. I first basically take the background by regularizing, by somewhat smoothing the whole uh, thing uh, with a diffusion filter called Perona Malik that sustains the, uh, the edges, but uh, otherwise blurs away any kind of noise artifacts. And then uh, I basically like to threshold now this uh, uh, particular case. But thresholding is one of the operations that are, uh, well, not too sexy in image processing, simply because you have a parameter and uh, if you fool around with the parameter, you, things work or they don't work. And the question is, what is a good parameter setting? So in order to come up with a good uh, algorithm, you have to have also a good algorithm to determine that threshold parameter. In this case, I gave you, uh, give you here an example on basically looking for the, um, for the uh, boundaries of all these cells. And uh, I find them by basically taking the second derivative and then do a crossing detect basically looking for the uh, point where the second derivative is zero, and that's the perfect boundary of a cell, usually under, uh, uh, if you look at this as an, as an edge under, uh, well, basically treating it like a function in calculus. And uh, I try to find these locations now with this uh, procedure here, and I find all the cells 
doing the crossing detect on the Laplacian filter. And then I multiply all these uh, positions uh, with uh, pixel values and then we do a histogram. So this basically gives me then a histogram of what the grayscale value is at the boundary of a cell. And of course, uh, if I basically position myself right in the typical grayscale level of such a boundary cell, uh, first by estimating here this as a gamma distribution and then uh, finding the estimate, like the median of this distribution, and take that as a threshold, I get a very robust uh, threshold uh, to obtain these uh, cells. And uh, now I can see how well I'm doing here. First of all, um, I have to identify the brain cells now. Again, do the same thing as before. I blur the whole thing. I find the maxima. And then I contract all the cases where cells actually overlap. Well, this is going to be a bit fast. I'm sorry, running out of time. And uh, so oh, let me jump ahead a little. Calculating now the cell walls by taking again uh, the gradient filter. And then I obtain an uh, image like this here, basically a seed in every cell again, and uh, kind of a wide wall around each cell due to the gradient filter. And now I apply a different segmentation routine that is called the watershed algorithm but that basically looks for kind of water basins in that uh, kind of um, mountainscape landscape that I have here. Uh, just you imagine you have rain falling down on this landscape, then uh, the cells basically function like water basins, and that's exactly how I determine here in this way the segments of each cell. And uh, I create a mask out of it, and I can thereby see how well I'm doing segmenting this thing. Here I have now lines every, in between everything, and then I basically extract these segments and now I project the fluoroscopy onto these segments and basically see how large the overlap is in each, for, each of that sec, or for each cell segment. And that gives me then a histogram of how much uptake each cell has, or how many cells have a certain uptake. And then I just extract here uh, with a certain threshold all the cells that have at least 30% of their pixels being colored by the fluorescent. And then I can mask that onto the uh, create a mask and then use that mask to highlight the area. And this is then the result. All the pink cells, they are the ones that got actually marked with the fluorescent. All the other ones shouldn't count. Okay, uh, one more application. This I'm going to skip. Uh, this is uh, an application or problem from material science. It's rather awkward. It basically gives you these kind of pictures. And what you see here is an alloy. And the bubbles, they are tungsten bubbles in an alloy, I, I forgot which it is uh, exactly, and uh, to deduce certain material properties, you have to find the angles between merging bubbles. So you have to measure the angle here uh, and here and so forth. And uh, this is a rather tricky thing because depending on what uh, resolution you look at this, uh, um, the angle does change. So um, you have to specify, we can only do this measurement properly by defining a specific scale and then doing that measurement at that scale. And I do this measurement, uh, well, before I do the measurement, I just clean up the data a little bit with the median a filter, uh, segmenting the thing, deleting all the tiny segments, and then I basically now have the bubbles uh, defined. And now I uh, basically don't go in here and uh, measure with some kind of uh, wedge the angle, but I do it completely different. Um, you basically can think of this uh, as, a, again, a, a mountainscape, and um, the isophotes, the lines of equal brightness or uh, for, between foreground and background, uh, these lines basically exhibit a curvature in these angles. Yeah, basically, a, curve, uh, a contour goes around and goes out again. And I can integrate the curvature of that contour. And then the integral of that curvature will give you an uh, indication of what the angle is, uh, uh, is, and then you can uh, basically read out the angle measurements just by integrating over the curvature. And I get the curvature uh, with different, uh, uh, well, the mathematics explained it here. I'm now a little bit short on time to go into detail, but the point is the curvature of a, uh, photo of a iPhone, uh, sorry, 
isophote, or basically of a contour, is given by this expression. So if you take the luminosity or the brightness of the image and take the second derivative in x, x, and uh, the, uh, the square of the derivative in y, and so forth, then you obtain kappa, which gives you the curvature, uh, the curvature of the isophote. And this is done in this command here in Mathematica. And uh, then I get this kind of uh, uh, return. This is basically now the curvature strength and these, and these wedges that I have in this particular image. And I just have to now basically sum over all these values to obtain the angle. And uh, I do this here. First of all, I separate segment every angle measurement because I don't want to sum over two angles at the same time. And then I do my curvature measurements, and these are the curvature measurements. And then I have to have some function that translates the curvatures into angles. And this I have done here, but I won't go into detail by basically uh, creating all kinds of artificial examples with a wedge and then just seeing what kind of uh, angle I get for certain curvature readings at what scale. I did this here. And at the end of the day, I can basically use tooltip to, pr uh, to project onto this image of my angle measurements. And just by going in there with the cursor, I can read out the angles like 108 degrees. This would be 60 degrees, because if you blur it, it actually would be combined. This is 75 degrees and so forth. So this is a typical case, a scenario in Mathematica that you have the freedom to program anything you like, and you can actually do measurements that no other software packages can do. And this concludes my little excursion into uh, microscopy. And uh, since I don't have an outlook what's to come, so I'd rather suggest have a look into the microscope and see what's, what's down there in the scale.